Hi, and welcome back to Nadia's Identity Files. I am very excited to have with me the beautiful Antonia Crane. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Are you excited to be here today? I am. Yay. This season, before the holidays, eat us alive completely. Right, and right outside we have this um, Christmas sweater sale going on. I'd like, just a few weeks ago, it was all Halloween stuff. I know. They so, move fast. No Thanksgiving. No Thanksgiving ugly sweater parties, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Are you already planning your New Year's? You know, my birthday <laughs> is on New Year's Eve. Oh, happy so, early birthday. Thank you, but I haven't given it any thought in spite of it being a landmark birthday, but nice. that will come. That will come. That will come. I won't ask about age. I know better. You know, know how it's ladies all good. Are. I'm going to be turning 30, so it's all I figured. good. Oh, you figured you were landmark. <laughs> yeah. Like, ah, huh. Landmark birthday. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you coming on today to talk about identity in the context of the adult entertainment industry and um, all the stigma that people from that background face, because I feel like it's something that is not talked about enough in spite of it being such a um, a widely consumed form of entertainment. I mean, a lot of people uh-huh. don't admit to enjoying, you know, porn or going to the strip club or you know, I just feel like so many archetypes are, and stereotypes are cast onto this industry. And your memoir, yeah. Spent, was just so poignant and so beautiful. And, of course, it was more of an examination of yourself and your mm-hmm. identity than the, an industry period. Yeah, thank you. Which is really important. And I think that's part of what the issue is, is people just lump everybody together. Yeah. Rather than just look at one person. Well, what I tried to do with Spent is I think of it as a grief memoir. And so while I'm really dealing with the grief of my mother's death, it's also a journey through the sex industry. And so I braided those two narratives together. Right. Because I, for me, I think the sex industry is about a deeply human experience. Yeah. And I found that to be so with your memoir. I mean, definitely the two narratives work beautifully together. And, you know, there's intersection in everything that we go through. There is. At all times. So, I mean, in terms of all of the, your professional identities, you obviously you have a background working in stripping, you're a writer, you're a professor, mm-hmm. and true you're story. also an activist. Hashtag truth. Get some social media action in here. Yeah. I've been an activist for a long time. I mean, in my coming of age happened in the 90s in San Francisco. And so I really became my identity through activism. And I actually became a sex worker through my activism originally. Uh, but in 1990. Six, I worked at a strip club that became the first successful stripper union oh, in the wow. United States. Uh, we were fighting a labor war, but we also, in that time, it was post-AIDS, and there was a lot of activism for queer rights and queer visibility and battered women, and um, I was in ACT UP San Francisco, and so we were doing a lot of activism, needle exchange, food not bombs at that time. And my and sex work was a natural segue out of activism. And so I met with these startlingly intelligent women that happened to be strippers. And I walked in to the club and immediately uh, we decided to unionize. And we um, I wrote a screenplay about it last year with Silas Howard, who's a great director and writer. And we're um, we're hopefully going to make that movie really soon. I think it's time for that narrative to yeah. be highlighted in this political climate. I mean, it's so exciting to hate the government again, I must say. <laughs> I know. I feel like now we really have a reason to be extra vocal, more vocal than ever before. We do. At the same time, though, it's frightening because it's like, I feel like people want to silence us more so also than ever right. before. But we just yeah. have to keep fighting against that narrative. Well, this is how counterculture happens. I mean, in uh, post-AIDS era San Francisco, That's what happened is we were busy hating the government and hating the oppression and the denial of AIDS was happening and all of our friends were dying. And so we were also raging with grief and we were wanting to change things. Right. And, you know, with women, I don't know if this is a woman thing, but it's also directly related to like the physical, the physicality that was happening around AIDS and how people were dying in front of us. You know, it it starts with the body. And yeah. so, like, sex work seemed like such a great segue into, like, using the body and performance as a way to um, to have a voice and right. to have, be a feminist and an activist. And yeah. I think it's time again. I mean, um, Trump's wife, we have an immigrant sex worker in the White House. Right? Yeah. I can't wait to write about it. Oh, my gosh. Please write about it. <laughs> immediately, like, let me know because I, I, I need to for sure read that. And I, I do agree that there is a necessary level of I mean, not to sidetrack too much, but in a necessary level of slut shaming that's 
um, happening towards Melania. But I mean, I, that's the greatest thing about her is her past. Yeah, I mean, it makes it as just an immigrant sex worker. It's we have celebrity style people running the country, Never running mind. the show. We've always loved our celebrities, Reagan, <laughs> Schwarzenegger. It's true. It's true. But I, I do think that you know, between the three, um, the person that we're dealing with now um, represents a, a very frightening segment that's obviously a large segment of the U.S. population. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, in terms of all of your your professional identities and just identity period, do you feel um, an alignment with one over the other? Or do you feel like everything is, you know, as you mentioned, intersection, everything intersects and kind of forms a one? Well, when you say everything, what do you mean exactly? Um, identity and activism and art? or Well, I feel you- like... Um, we forget that identity encompasses more than just like the standard, like, Oh, I'm a woman, I'm bisexual or whatever else. We also have our professional identities. And in terms of, um, you know, probably in your mind, you still feel a connection with your work as a stripper and your work Mm -hmm. as a writer and a professor. I mean, to me, it seems like everything is all connected. Um, one serves as a catalyst to kind of spur the next. Right. Um, I think that they, um, I think that I really, uh, am an embodied person. Like I don't, sep- I don't live a separate life. I don't live a secret life. I don't act differently in the strip club than I necessarily do. Maybe it's a little, the volume's turned up on the personality a little bit, but I'm still stripping. I'm like the last man standing I as a stripper. It. And I am also a professor. Um, I was a visiting professor at UCSD and I'm now at UCLA extension. And then you asked me if, um, like if my students or if the student body, uh, stigmatized me or shamed me, and I just wanted to address that directly. And not necessarily the that. student body. I think I said the academic world. That's a different. That's um. I have not um suffered from that at UCLA. I mean, we live in a great city that embraces a lot of lefty politics. But yeah. I will say that there is a lot of political, politically correct shaming. What I will right. call politically correct shaming, and that has to do with there's a lot of lefty, super intellectual white males who throw around words like whore and prostitute in their writing and they love to exploit the experience in a way that I find very demeaning and dehumanizing and sexist. Yeah. And they probably use those words in such a, um, an archetypal sense in a sense that's obviously imbued with bias and judgment when they pour it. Right. Yeah. And they probably try and cast it off as yeah. highfalutin they um, do. academic. They do language. I wrote an essay about it on medium.com called uh, Reds, and it has to do with the anger that I felt going to a really fancy writing uh, workshop on the East Coast and going to a couple of lectures where words like whore and prostitute were kind of thrown around in a demeaning way. And, you know, my, my advice is to have empathy and, and forgiveness and kindness and always, and like offer a sex worker a job. Like off, you know, reach your hand out to sex workers, help them segue into the mainstream, give them acting jobs, give, give us writing jobs, give us a right. chance. Um, and because, you know, our stories are intelligent, but what they prefer to do is exploit us for their own amusement and for their, and use, um, our life experiences for their entertainment and amusement. Right. It's almost like putting... that's the shaming that I'm talking about. That's the stuff yeah. that hurts is like, hire us, hire right. us for jobs you know, help us segue out of the industry. Well, it's like sexual appropriation, right? Yeah, it's sexual appropriation. Like, they love the stories of the sex workers mm-hmm. and the horrors and the strippers. You see it in every TV show. But, you know, why don't you talk to one? Why don't you date one? Why don't you give one a job? You mentioned, um, well, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to form this question, but you mentioned Lolita. You felt like oh, you were yeah. turning into Lolita. In oh, your this is in my peak. early 20s, sweetheart. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, you know, all of these things contribute to our, you know, obviously the w- things I went through in my high school age contributed to how I manifest and how I self-present now. Yeah. If I if it didn't, you know, everything would be completely different. Oh, are you talking and, about the part of my book where I turned into that um, character? You, you mentioned, in, which I was going to connect this thought to the fact that I feel like these elite academics mm-hmm. are 
looking at um, the female sexual experience and almost like a Lolita type. Oh, of, I see what you mean. The um, archetype. Right. Right. Okay. In that also, um, it's like they're trying to diminish your experience and make you feel like you're younger, like perpetually keep you down, not just in terms of. Yeah. Allowing a woman to mature in the sex industry yeah. is something that needs to be addressed. And I would love to see, I mean, I'm writing a pilot right now, um, you know, and I, I definitely want to show older strippers. I want to show strippers aging. I want to show strippers in very stable relationships, right. In lesbian relationships, um, yeah. in, you know, taking care of each other on the job and outside of the job, watching each other's backs, having each other's backs in the world, uh, you know, working together as a team instead of like this vicious backbiting virgin right. whore competitive you know, yeah. that's only a tiny bit of the truth, but, you know, allowing, there's a lot of older strippers and older porn stars and that uh, have really uh, valid experiences, and I'd love to see that portrayed more. Do you think the competitive um, nature of stripping or the sex industry or really any industry, you know, with where women are together is a result of misogyny? Absolutely. Or, you know, I would say it has to yeah. be, yeah. Internalized misogyny, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? So much good has been said. When can we expect? <laughs> we have so much more to say. I can so talk much to more you to say. I, I know, right? We'll have to have a follow up or something. We will. Absolutely. Um, before we break to have our next interview, and of course, you know, we have our standard commercial break. Sorry, guys. We've got to get that in there. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit or when we can expect um, to see your project must be come into fruition? Yeah. yeah. Um, we are looking for a way to make that movie now is all I can really say right now. But we have a lot of support from the community at this moment. And it's a really good time, I think, to make it. So look out for it in the next year. It's Wonderful. called The Lusty. It's attached to director Silas Howard, who directed Transparent and This Is Us. And uh, I'm really excited about it. And I think it's a really great time for that voice to be heard. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> thank you for doing this. Thank and thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Right.